Okay, we are live. Audio and video is up, uh, and the lecture slides are available. So, welcome to lecture 17. This is our last lecture before the uh, the exam, uh, and I want to be clear about the topics today. I'm not going to put a. I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'm not going to put a shear and moment diagram for a frame on the exam. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to assign a homework on shear and moment diagrams for the fr for frames. In fact, today I'm not giving you a homework assignment. In fact, there are no new uh, homework assignments that are going to be assigned until after we've completed the first exam. So you all get a little bit of a break on homework. I've been giving you homework every day, uh, and and today you're you're getting a break, and, and you're not going to get any homework uh, on Monday. Um, uh, and, and again, I mentioned this at the beginning, I'm going to say it again, uh, you all have been doing a, a, a fantastic job in here, and I just really want to say that. I, I mean, you know, this is a very visual class, and, and there's a lot of diagrams, a lot of figures, and there's a lot of, uh, of you know, you have to have a visual uh, understanding and a conception of, of what we're doing in here, and y'all are doing really great, and I, I just, I really wanted to say that. Um, Today, what we're going to do is we're going to try, we're going to wrap up shear and moment diagrams, and we're going to talk about shear and moment diagrams for frames. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because there's, I'm going to be honest, there's not really a lot to say. If you understand how to draw a shear and moment diagram for a beam, it's just the same thing. It's just tilted. Uh, and so I have an example, but it's actually already worked out. And so I'm just going to go through the solution. Everything's on the, uh, the, the course notebook in Teams, so you all can access that on your own. Um, I want to spend the rest of the day trying to lay the groundwork for what we talk about after the exam, which is deflections. Um, and the way in which we, we derive uh, uh, the, the, uh, the way in which we do deflections, uh, we use what's called the principle of virtual work. It's a little weird the first time you see it. It makes sense, but it definitely feels like a deviation from what we've been talking about up until now. And so today I want to lay the groundwork on those energy principles. Uh, and then when we come back from the exam, I want to hit the ground running on using the method of virtual work. Uh, so let's just uh, jump right into it. Um, so first off, you know, we're still going to use the same relationship for load, shears, and uh, moments. You know, none of that's going to change. Uh, and none of the conclusions for our graphical approach are, are going to change when we look at shear and moment diagrams for frames. It's all the same uh, process. Um, what changes with a shear and moment diagram for frame? Well, not much. Um, the only differences are that we plot the shear and moment diagrams parallel to the members. So what I mean by that is if we're looking at a frame, and let's say we're looking at, let's, let's say, this member, then we plot the shear diagram on its side, and we plot the moment diagram on its side. So, you know, it, it, imagine if you took that member and sort of turned it 90 degrees to where it was left to right, you would just draw the shear and moment diagram like you normally would. So it's, it's not any different. Um, the only thing that can be a little bit um, new, and even then it's not really that, that complicated, is sometimes we need to cut sections and investigate the equilibrium solely at the joints. Uh, and the reason for doing that is if you have like multiple members all meeting at a common joint, sometimes you need to investigate the equilibrium of that joint just to make sure that you're following along uh, and, and uh, it serves as a good uh, gut check. Sometimes it's necessary if you've got like a member inside a frame and you kind of need to figure out the enforces, uh, but it also uh, serves as a check. Um, I want to walk through a shear and moment diagram example for a frame. Uh, here's the frame I came up with. It's just a two-member frame. I've got one, I'm going to call it the column. That's the vertical member, uh, member AB. Uh, and then I have the beam, member BC. So the beam is going to be the left to right member, and the column is going to be the vertical member, the up and down member. Um, I have a 75 kip load applied vertically between B and C, and I have a 60 kip load applied laterally between A and B. Uh, and so there's some terms for you between lateral load and vertical load. Um, and then I have a hinge roller boundary condition. So the loads are pretty simple. I don't want this problem to be uh, a challenge there. Just what's the difference? It's, it's a frame. It's just, it's not a beam. Okay. And again, like I said, the only difference between a beam and a frame is that a, a frame, you're drawing the shear and diagram, shear, uh, diagrams and the moment diagrams on their side. That's, that's pretty much it. So let me stop the share and pull up the notebook. Um, give me one sec. Okay, so, so here's the frame. 
And, uh, you know, first off, with any shear and moment diagram problem, uh, the first step is determining your support, you know, to determine your support reactions. Uh, we've already done that here. Uh, 60 kips going to the right, so AX is 60 kips going to the left, and then you just use your moment and force equilibrium to determine that AY is 30 kips going up and CY equals 45 kips going up. Now, the thing with uh, your reactions is the, the same checks apply or the same uh, uh, means of checking your answer with shear and moment diagrams with beams still work for frames. And that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, with shear diagrams, you better start at zero and end at zero. And with moment diagrams, you better start at zero and end at zero. Um, the only difference is, uh, you know, because we're drawing each of those pieces separately, uh, we're drawing the shear diagram for the column separately than from the beam. What we have to do is we have to cut this into separate pieces. So that means we have to cut a section. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, for this problem, we could just basically treat it as, you know, the column and the beam. Just treat it as two separate members. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to treat it a bit more generally. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the column, cut the beam, and then cut just this little joint, okay? And so we're actually gonna investigate the equilibrium of three separate components. And again, the reason why I'm doing that is because if you have a more complicated frame, let's say you have a, a frame like this, this is fixed and this is fixed. By the way, this frame is you know, very indeterminate. Um, then what you would do is you investigate the, uh, the equilibrium of each element, you know, each beam and each column, but you would also investigate the equilibrium of, you know, that joint, because that joint is going to have, you know, a shear here, an axial force, a moment, and then there's going to be a shear here, an axial force, and a moment, and, and they've all got a match. Uh, and the same thing's true here. Like, you got to make sure that, that equilibrium is maintained just, not just for your members, uh, but for your joints. So let's take each of these one at a time. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to investigate the equilibrium of this vertical member, this column. Uh, and so uh, wh what I'm doing here is I'm cutting this, this member out, and I'm looking here at joint B, and I'm asking myself, okay, at joint B, I need to have, uh, I need to determine my unknown force in the X direction, my unknown force in the Y direction, and my unknown moment, just like I would with any section cut. It's no different. Now, um, with, uh, with my X force, I can do observation. I can say I've got 60 to the right, 60 to the left. So there is no unknown force in the X direction. For the Y direction, I have 30 kips going up, so I better have 30 kips going down. Uh, and then summing moments at B, uh, I've just, you know, I've got 60 going that way. I've got 60 going this way. Uh, and so, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, I can determine the required moment at B to uh, achieve equilibrium. Pretty straightforward. Uh, for member BC, I, I, really the same story. You know, I've um, 75 going down. I've got 45 going down, so that means i got to have 30 going up. Um, I've got no forces in the X and Y directions. So that means that the BX uh, is zero. Uh, and then... Sum of moments at B gives me the, uh, 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 the same moment. Now, just to be clear, if you look at the numbers, the numbers all match. Like I've got 30 and I've got 30. And then this came out as 600 and this came out as 600. So if I'm being completely honest, the investigation of the joint equilibrium is really not all that necessary for this problem. But I, I want to go through the practice just to make sure you kind of got an idea of what we're talking about. So, again, while it's not necessary to uh, uh, investigate the equilibrium at joint B, it can be critical for frame connections with three or more members because it serves as a check that your joint's in equilibrium. And if you've got a frame that's got a bunch of members all framing it into a common joint, it can be necessary because, you know, you can use statics. Let's say you got three members framing into uh, a given um uh, connections. So like you got a column, a beam, and another column. Well, you could have the answers for this column and have the answers for this beam. But if you're trying to find the answers for this uh, uh, column, you can use the investigation of the equilibrium at the joint to say, well, this member has, you know, a shear of 60 kips, and this one has an axial force of 20 kips. That means that has to be 80 kips going that way or, or, or what have you. 
Uh, so there, like I said, there, there's you know a reason for doing it. Not necessary for this problem, but in general, it can be necessary. And so, what I did here is I just uh, redrew all of the uh, free body diagrams that I had just derived, and then I just used the equal and opposite. So, for example, if I look at the beam, this is 600 foot kips that is uh, clockwise. So this has to be 600 foot kips that's counterclockwise. If this is 30 kips going up, then this has to be 30 kips going down. And so I just use that equal and opposite thing uh, on this end, and then do the same thing with these forces uh, and here, just you know, equal and opposite. And then once I've got all my forces written down, I just take a look at the joint and see, is the joint in equilibrium? And take a look and you can see that it is. 30 up, 30 down. 600 foot kips acting clockwise, 600 foot kips acting counterclockwise. So the joint is in equilibrium. And then once you've determined that, again, the shear and moment diagrams, not all that complicated. You just draw them over to your side. So the shears, you know, you start at the bottom, work your way over. So 60 up, over, 60 down, you know, pretty simple. Uh, and then your moment diagram, constant shear, constant slope on your moment diagram, zero sear, zero slope on your moment diagram. Pretty simple. Um, same procedures work with your areas. You know, I have a positive 600 area, so I go up to 600. What happens at the top? I've got this concentrated moment that brings me back to zero. Um, the only other thing I want to mention is now you can start to see where these tick marks become really, really important because see how I've got them drawn upwards? I'm drawing them upwards to indicate I started my diagrams here and I worked my way up. I could have done it opposite. I could have started my diagrams at the top and worked my way down and I'd get some you know, flipping of some of my diagrams. But again, the, that's just to show the direction that you're drawing them. Nothing really right or wrong, but by drawing it this way, you know the direction that's being assumed. Uh, same with BC, draw them uh, over again. I don't think there's anything really, really magical about these uh, shear and moment diagrams. Uh, but as you can see, the cutting the sections at B was necessary because if you didn't do that, you wouldn't know that you needed to start off by jumping up 30 kips uh, on your shear diagram and then jumping up uh, 600 uh, kips or foot kips on your moment diagram. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I know I went through that kind of quick, but that's, that's pretty much it for, for moment diagrams and shear diagrams for frames. Not anything that's uh, like increased in difficulty. There's not really any new tricks that you need to learn. It's just the same stuff, um, just, you know, oriented at a different angle. Um, are there any questions before we move on to our deflection topic? I want to give you a sec on this. Okay. Um, oh. Let me go back to um, the slides. Okay, so uh, with that, if, you know, assuming there are no questions, let's go ahead and move on to the concept of deflections. Okay, so to be clear, this is, we are definitely in exam two territory, and I'll be, you know, I want to make that clear, um, but I want to talk about how we go about this, and one of the, there's a few reasons why I focus on energy methods. Like I said right before class started, if you open your textbook, there are a number of different ways that you compute uh, deflections. So for instance, if you talk about beams, uh, with beams in your textbook, there are really two classes of methods. There are energy methods, and then there are what are called geometric methods. Uh, and the difference is that geometric methods try and take into account the uh, behavior of the differential equation for beams. Um, the reason why I focus on energy methods is because one, um, there's less to remember, uh, and two, energy methods work for like 
everything. They work for every structure uh, that you would ever uh, uh, deal with because they, they rest on a very, very fundamental principle, uh, and that's the law of conservation of energy. So let's talk about the law of conservation of energy. So this is back to basic physics, and it states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, and instead it can only be converted to various forms. Now, everybody in this class has done an energy methods problem at some point in their academic career, and a very, very common one is an example in physics, okay? So let's talk about gravitational problems. So I have a pretty, uh, I thought was a kind of a funny example. I've got uh, Mario here, and we've got a platform, and we've got a Goomba right there. So there's the Goomba. Um, maybe I'll use a different color there because that's not coming out uh, kind of clear. Let's use, I don't know, yellow. There's the Goomba, and the Goomba is getting ready to fall off the platform. Okay, so right now the Goomba has a gravitational potential energy, a stored potential energy equal to mass times gravity times height. And then once the Goomba falls off the platform or walks off the platform, the Goomba is going to start falling. Uh, and then uh, once the Goomba starts to fall, that gravitational potential energy is going to be converted into a kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is going to equal one half mv squared. And so this is one of the reasons or one of the ways that you can arrive and prove that barring the, the resistance of, of uh, air drag or, or uh, uh, friction from air resistance, uh, a marble and a bowling ball will fall at the same rate of change of velocity because the, the velocity and the rate at which uh, objects fall is independent of an object's mass. And this is one of the ways that you do that is that you use uh, the energy principles that energy cannot be created or destroyed. And so we can use a similar energy method to compute deflections in structures. And so I have another video game related example here. I've got Link getting ready to uh, shoot a bow. How, how does a bow work? Okay, so you have the bow, right? And you take the bow and you put the arrow, you knock, knock the arrow on, on the, the, the string of the bow, and then you draw the bow. OK, so what you do when you draw the bow is, OK, so let's say that for the sake of discussion, this rubber band serves as my example for the bow. So here's the, the bow and we'll say that that I, I hold it like this. Now, I'm not putting any like tension on the rubber band. I'm just sort of holding it there. And then what I do is I take that rubber band and I move it through a displacement. OK, just like the bow, I take the bow and I draw the bow back. Now, what does that do? That, that does work to the system. Let's go back to physics. How do you define work? It's a force times the distance, right? So you're taking the, the bow and you're moving it. You're doing work to the system because you're applying a work, a force times the distance. Now that work doesn't just disappear into thin air. It's got to go somewhere. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So what happens is the bow responds by storing that energy inside the bow right it's one of the reasons it's, it's how a bow works like when you let this uh when you let this go boom it, it you know the the, the bow transfers that energy into the arrow and then and then there you go okay so yes sir now if under the notion of a bow i thought it sometimes amplifies the work you apply because you're pulling back by a certain amount of force but then it would release the bow with a lot more force when it hits. Well, it's well, one, it's directing that energy, and I and I'm not, and also I'm not talking about you know like a compound bow or something. I'm just trying to keep it, you know, you know just like a, a base example. But it is directing that energy to to the bow. Now, again, um, while it might be very effective in directing that energy, you can't create or destroy energy. Um, it, it can it can just serve as a means of directing it uh, uh, very efficiently. D does that make sense? Now, why am I why am I talking about bows? Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this in, in response to structures. So, what I have here, I've got this little rubber beam, and I, you probably seen. I think I've used this a couple times in here, but this is really where this this prop gets to shine, okay? Now here's the beam. The beam is on these two supports here, and it's it's just sitting there. It doesn't have any load on it. Now let's take a, a, a force. Let's say this is my, my tape dispenser. It's not very heavy. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put it like this. And I'll take this and I'll I'll put it on the beam and watch what happens. You could kind of see it, the 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 beam deformed, right? Kind of see that? And then 
beam deforms. Okay. Now, what happened? Well, there was work done to the system. This this tape uh, dispenser put work on the system. There was a, a force times displacement. There's a little bit of a, a nuance as to how we do it, but for the sake of discussion, let's just keep that, that idea in mind. Now, I propose that the beam, just like the rubber band, just like the bow, is storing that energy. Okay, and so the idea is that we can compute, if we can quantify the energy that this beam is storing in order to, uh, the, the, the energy that this beam is storing in response to this, and if we recognize that energy cannot be created or destroyed, we can say energy in equals energy out, and we can solve for the displacement because that's what we're after. This is a, a problem involving deflections. We want to know how much this beam is deflecting. That's kind of, that's kind of the idea. Okay, now, like I said, the derivation that we're about to do is going to get a little out there, so bear with me, but, but I'll try and make it uh, as painless as possible. Okay, so uh, talking about energy, like I said, energy cannot be created or destroyed, okay? So we're going to use a specific energy method for deflections, and uh, what I'm going to focus on are two types of energy components the external work done to a system, and the stored energy as a response. Now, the external work done to the system, uh, uh, in the external work done to the system, I, I propose, hold on, let me see. Isn't the displacement reliant upon the beam's material as well? Yes, it is. You are exactly right. And so um, where that comes into play is the stored energy. And so the stored energy in, a, in the uh, system is going to be a function of the E value and, 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 and other aspects. Um, what we're going to do, I know I've been showing you a beam. We're going to start off by focusing on axial loads and then we'll extend it to bending moments. So we're going to handle beams later. I know admittedly I'm using a, a beam here, but we're going to start off with axial loads uh, and then we're going to go to, uh, to beams. But you are correct. The beam, not only the beams material or the elements, you know, material properties, but also its section properties. You know, what's its moment of inertia? How big around it is it? Everything you're saying, 100% correct. Okay. So, our two energy components are going to be the external work that's done to the system and the, the stored energy as a response. Now, the stored energy comes from like the stored response due to axial loads, the stored response due to bending moment. If we wanted, we could consider like other things. We could consider torsional responses. We could consider thermal responses. Um, in our applications in here, we're going to neglect those. And here's why. The really the big two that I'm, I'm interested that you can handle is axial loads and bending moment. And the reason why is because axial loads deal with essentially constant responses and bending moments deal with variable responses because with bending moments, we're gonna have to integrate. But if you can handle constant responses and variable responses, you can handle pretty much any response. So we'll take those two and if you can handle those, you can pretty much uh, handle any. Now again, for all the scenarios, the work in has to equal the work out. So I'm gonna use W to represent the external work done to the system and U to be the stored energy as a response, okay? Now let's, uh, let's do some figuring here, okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna take some bar, okay? And uh, just to make sure that we're on the same page. So I've got here some bar on the board and we're gonna take this bar and let's just put some load on it. And I'm gonna make a number up. Let's say we put, I don't know, 20 kips on it, okay? So we have a bar and we put 20 kips on it. I propose that if you take that bar, you take that bar and you stretch it. So you, you take your bar and you put 20 kips on it, it's gonna stretch it. Now, how much does it stretch it? I don't know, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. But uh, we're gonna use an energy method to try and figure that very issue out. Now, let's see. Now, here's the bar. So we have the bar. It's subjected to some axial load P. I propose that the bar stretches by some amount delta. And that's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out delta. Now, if the load's applied gradually, which is how it's done in, in you know, physical systems. I mean, think of the example with me with the tape dispenser. I have the, the beam. I take this tape dispenser. I put it on. That's applied gradually. So we start out at zero. And then as we apply the load, the member displaces. Now, 
for the entirety of what we're doing in this class, we're going to assume linear responses. So, uh, you know, the stress and strain are going to be proportional to one another using Young's modules. So everything in here is going to be linear. You can do nonlinear structural analysis if you want, uh, but you got to master linear analysis first because that, that can start to get ramped up real quick. Okay. So, you know, as the load increases, the displacement increases as well. I propose that the total amount of work done to the system is going to be the area under that curve, and that's a triangle, so it's one-half P times delta. So that's the external work done to the system. Now, what about the internal work done to the system? What happens internally? Well, internally, the bar is going to respond using the uh, uh, by, by storing the same amount of energy. Now, how do we compute that? This goes into the stuff that Mr. Randolph was talking about uh, in his comment. So we start off using, you know, basic, you know, Hooke's law, stress equals E times strain, right? Y'all should remember that. Um, either from deformables or civil engineering materials, you know, the idea that you take a bar and you yank on it, it extends, and then the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus E is that proportionality constant that is unique to a given material, right? And so, you know, uh, you know how like uh, the unit weight of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, is one of those numbers that should just be burned into the back of your memory. Well, Young's modulus for steel, for example, E is 29,000 KSI, and I'm going to burn that number in the back of your head by the time you're done with me at Marshall University. You will remember that number. Um, now, uh, what we can do is we can expand that expression a bit, and we can say that, um, uh, you know, sigma equals E times the strain. Well, what is sigma? Sigma is the stress. That's force over area. And then epsilon is the strain. Remember, how do you define strain? It's the change in length over the original length. And so what I can do is I can take this, uh, this uh, stress equals E times uh, strain expression, and I can say, well, the stress is F over A, the, uh, the E is delta over L, and I can solve for delta, just FL over EA, uh, and then use the same approach, you know, the one-half base times the height, and I can get an expression for the, uh, for the U value. Now, before I open it up to questions, I want to make a point. Um, it might be a little weird, like, well, hold on, Dr. Mike, why are you using P on this slide, because you applied some load P, and why are you using F on this slide? I'll explain why. So, if I have, let's say, a bar here, okay, so I have a bar, and I put 20 kips on that bar. It's pretty simple looking at a single bar that if I put 20 kips on that bar, that bar responds with 20 kips and tension. So the F and the P are the same. That, that's easy. I, I, don't, I don't think that's under uh, any degree of debate. However, what happens if I have a truss and I, I've got this truss and I decide, okay, let's put the 20 kips right here. So P is 20 kips, okay? And maybe I'll erase this, this bar so that I got a little room. Okay. So if I put 20 kips here, does that mean that every member in that truss results in a 20 kip uh, uh, load uh, stored to the system? Well, no. Like if I have 20 kips here, maybe this member has, I don't know, 40 kips in compression. Maybe this member has 50 kips in tension. Maybe this is a zero force member. Maybe that one's in compression, you know, whatever, right? So what we would do practically in a truss analysis is we would have our external work done, which is 20 kips uh, over two times delta. And then our stored energy, what we would do is we would use the expression that we had derived. We have, you know, F squared L over two EA but I'm going to be able to compute this for each member of the truss because this member is going to have a length and an E and an A. This member is going to have a length, an E and an A. This member is going to have a length, an E and an A. So instead, what I'll do is I'll sum this for all the members in the truss, right? And so what I'll do is I'll set W equal U and just solve for delta, okay? Does that concept make sense, this, this idea of setting the external work done equal to the stored strain energy? Now, I'll go ahead and tell you there is a little bit of a problem with what I've done here, but I'm going to resolve that here in a second. But just, just bear with me so far. Um, 
Does this make sense so far? Yeah. Okay, good deal. All right, now let me go back to So let me go back to this. So this is where we were at here. So we have the uh, we have the external work done, and we have the storage strain energy. Okay. Now everything that I have on the slide or on the slide, and everything I have on the whiteboard is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But it doesn't mean it's all that useful. Here's why. I want to show you something. I, I know I'm hopping back and forth on the share, so bear with me. Okay, so this is just for a sake of discussion. This is an image from a software analysis using a program called uh, RESA. We're going to use RESA later on uh, this semester uh, after we do deflections because RESA is a, is a computer program that will perform a lot of structural analysis for us. And so what I did is the, the truss that I drew here on the board, what I did is I just modeled this in RESA and I just gave it some, you know, uh, re uh, reasonable values for ease and cross-sectional areas and lengths and, and all that stuff. Uh, and then when you run this, what you get is you get an image that looks something like this. So the the gray sort of uh, shadow is what the truss looks like before it's deflected. And then the magenta, the pink sort of uh, truss in the front is what the truss looks like after it's deflected. And it's scaled up a little bit so that you can actually see it. OK. And so I propose that if you want to determine the deflection right here, you can do everything that I just said. You can say that storage strain energy is the sum of F squared L over 2EA for all the members. And the work is uh, P delta over 2, P being uh, the 20 kips. That's fine. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Here's, here's, okay, and, and what we're talking about here, the principle that I'm showing you right now, this method, this would be the method of what's called real work. This is the method of real work, using the actual loads on the structure to determine deflections. And that's good, great, grand, and wonderful. The problem, there's two problems with it. First problem is work principles require a load present. In other words, this is fine, but what if I want to find the deflection right there, okay? I can't find the deflection right there without a load present. See, if I don't have a load present right there, then the method of real work does not allow you to determine deflections at any other location. That's one issue, but, but here's another issue, okay? This method also works only when you have a uh, a truss with only one load or a system. It's not even just trusses, it's just systems a system with only one load applied. Well, what if this truss didn't just have 20 kips? What if it had a 60 kip load right here? What if it had a 40 kip load right here? What if it had a 30 kip load right there? Then if that's the case, then we're going to have to develop a new method, a way of getting around these inconsistencies. And the inconsistencies really center on the fact that we don't have a load where we want to find deflection. And so how do we fix that? We put a load there, okay? And so now we're going to start introducing a more general energy method, which is the one that's much more useful, called the method of virtual work. So let me go back to the slides and sort of show you what we're going to do. Okay, so for the sake of discussion, so we've got our uh, stored strain energy and our 
um, external work done, these methods were, and these formulas that I came up with were only if there was a single load applied. What happens when we apply two loads? So now what I want to do is I want to take this problem, this algebra, and I want to complicate it a bit. And I apologize for the, the algebra and the, the little bit of a, a messy derivation, but I, I'll show you what happens and, and how the formula arrives at something that's a bit more general. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply P1. So instead of dealing with one load, we're going to do two. So let's apply P1, and so the bar will deflect some amount delta 1. And then let's apply P2, and the bar will respond by stretching an additional amount, P2, or delta 2. So we have the total load after stage 2 is P1 plus P2, and the total deflection is delta 1 plus delta 2. Um, and so if I look at the external work done, now there's a little bit more going on. Okay, so what I've done is I've plotted that out, and now I'm going to break that work expression up into a few pieces. We'll call this work one, work two, work three. And, and, and it's really worth taking a second and just digesting what's on the plot here. You know, this is the x-axis is displacement, the y-axis is the load. So this is P1, for instance, on the y-axis, and this is P1 plus P2. But from a dimensions perspective, this, is, this dimension is P1, that dimension is P2. So just make sure that you're, you're able to differentiate between what the value is on the axis and what the dimensions are, because that's kind of important. Same thing with the displacements. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, draw, uh, determine area under this curve, and I'm going to determine that using three different regions. I'm going to use W1, W2, and W3. And so when you look at my expression right here, um, that should be pretty easy to follow, but you'll notice that of these terms, I've got three terms, you know, that one, that one, and that one. The one in the middle, it's funny how it doesn't have a one half next to it. And the reason it doesn't have the one half is because it's a triangle, it's a rectangle, okay? That might seem straightforward, but, you know, I, I just want to make sure that we're following along. Now that's the external work done. What about the stored strain energy? Well, the stored strain energy, again, it's going to follow a similar, um, a similar approach, but I'm going to introduce a little bit of a different notation. Um, instead of an F1 and an F2, uh, I'm introducing a big F and a little f, okay? So if I, um, you know, if you look here, this big F here and this little f here, and so that's little f, that's little f plus big F uh, and whatnot. I'm doing that for a reason. I'm not doing it to uh, make it any more complicated. I'm doing it because we're going to see that notation in our general principle for virtual work coming up real soon. And so I'm going to do the same process. I'm going to follow along the areas, you know, the U1 plus U2 plus U3. Again, using the same, you know, terms and following that out. Uh, and so just so we're clear, little f is the internal force generated by P1, and big F is the internal force generated by P2, okay? So what we'll do uh, is we'll do the same thing, you know, set energy 1 equal to energy 2. So, uh, or sorry, the, the, um, we'll set the, uh, the X, not energy 1, energy 2, the external work done equal to the stored strain energy. And so... U has to equal W, but, but the thing is, what makes this kind of neat is that has to work also for each component, right? It's not just, you know, U equals W, it's also each little component, like U1 has to equal W1, U2 has to equal W2, U3 has to equal W3. And so what we're going to find is that the, the two component, the U2 the, the, uh, or the W2, those are going to be the ones that are the most useful, okay? And I want to show you why, and then we're going to stop for today, okay? So I want to, I want to write this out, okay? Just, uh, just bear with me on here. So we have U2 equals F, FL over EA, and then we have W2 equals P1 delta 2. Now, that just seems like a bunch of symbols.
symbols, but there's real magic going on here. So, first off, let's let's focus on this. Okay. So this is the stored energy in the system. Okay, and we're only going to use that second component because again, we can use the law of conservation of energy and compare it against the counterpart. Okay, there's some real magic here because what I've got is I've got this little f and this big f separated. Okay, and so little f is the internal forces. generated from P1, and then the same thing here. These are the internal forces from P2. And so because of the way that we've framed this, we actually have the freedom to handle each analysis separately. We don't have to combine them. We can just do an analysis for P1 and an analysis for P2 separately. That's going to make our lives a little easier uh, later on. And so that's one thing. There's also some real magic going on here. Okay. The, the magic going on here is I have an unknown displacement. That's the goal. That's my goal. That's what I want to try and determine. I want to try and determine that unknown displacement. Okay. And then I have it in terms of this. And the beauty of it is I can choose this to be whatever I want because this corresponds to that and I can keep these separate. And what you have here is the core of the method of virtual work. So just to give you some a peek into what's going to happen after exam one, here's what's going to happen, okay? So let's say that you have a truss, okay? And the truss, it doesn't really, you know, matter what the truss looks like, and it doesn't matter um, if this is, you know, 30 kips. It doesn't matter if this is 60 kips. It, it doesn't matter. Let's say it's got these loads on it. And what I want to find, what I want to find, let's say I want to find right here, What's the deflection? I'm just making it up. It doesn't matter. It could be any point on the structure. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do two separate analyses. I'm going to do this analysis, which you could sort of, if you want to think about it uh, based on the variables that we came up with, this is sort of our P2 analysis. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do a completely separate analysis of a structure that looks just like this. So it's going to be the same structure. And I'll, I'll clean that up a little bit. And so we're going to do a completely uh, uh, similar structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, remember my energy principle breaks down uh, whenever I don't have a load where I'm trying to compute the energy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a separate analysis with no loads on it except for P1. So I'm going to put a P1 there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, P1 delta 2 is the sum of little f big F L over EA. That's going to be my method of virtual work. And so this, this equation's got some magic in it because I can determine the deflections due to all of these loads based off of the results from this analysis, F, and based off of this analysis, little f. The only question is, what do I choose for P1? I can choose whatever I want. Well, if I look at this equation, I don't know about you, but the easiest value for me is to just choose one. And so what I do is I set P1 equal to 1. So you could choose P1 to be anything because this P1 is associated with these F terms. They're related. So as long as they match, you could choose whatever you want. I'll choose it to be 1. And so um, sometimes, you know, we call the method of virtual work the unit load method. 
uh, but it basically means the same thing. What we do is we end up doing two separate analyses. We do an analysis of the structure with the loads as they are. We sometimes call that the real analysis. And then what we do is a completely separate structural analysis where we put only one load on it, and that's the load that we're interested in. You know, if we're trying to determine deflection here, we put a load there, and we put it in the direction that we assume it's going to deflect. If we get a negative answer, guess what? We were wrong. It deflects upward. And that is the method of virtual work. Um, I Again, I don't expect you to memorize that because don't worry when we come back from the exam we're going to have a lot of examples and, and methods on on going through that but i did want to make sure that that made sense here let me get these books out of the way so that you can kind of see what was on the uh, uh, on this uh, board here does anybody have any questions about this concept i know it's a little weird it's a little bit of a uh, you know that's a that's probably not what you expected on, on Friday morning, um, but I think it's pretty straightforward when it's all said and done. I think that in the end, um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's based on some very con sense principles, you know, energy in equals energy out. And on top of that, there's a bit of creativity to it. Any questions? None that come to mind. All right. Well, I want this concept to sort of stew in your head for a bit. I want you to think about this. Um, I don't want you to think about it. But I want you to sort of um, uh, have it in the back of your head so that when we come back after the first exam, we are ready to go with uh, deflections. We're going to start off when we come back from the exam from for doing, uh, we're going to do trusses first. We're really not going to spend that much time on it um, because once you can do the deflection for one truss, you can do the deflection for any truss. It, it's pretty simple. We're going to spend most of our time on beams because with beams, you have to integrate. And so the variable functions is really what's going to take up our time. And so that's going to be the, uh, the hard part. Um, but... One final thing before we call it, so you all have uh, an exam review on Monday. If you've never had me for class before, what I like to do is this. So again, I know there's been a lot of questions over the past few days about the logistics. I'm going to go through the logistics in very, very clear detail on, um, on Monday. I'll spend about five or ten minutes on that, talk about how we're going to operate the exam, what's going to be on the exam. Uh, and then it is your job to ask me questions. So I want you to come to class ready with questions. I want you to, you know, do some digging on your own. Ask yourself, okay, what do I want to, uh, what do I want to ask about? Um, and, and, you know, if we can talk about example problems. We can talk about homework assignments. We can talk about, you know, really whatever, but come prepared, ready to ask questions. Uh, and then Wednesday we will have our exam. That is all I have, uh, everybody. I want you all to have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and we will see you all on Monday.